Good morning. Good to see you. We're glad you're here at church today. Let's stand. We've been learning this song a little bit, done it a couple of times. We think you'll pick up on it. We're going to shout Hosanna. Hosanna means that Jesus saves. Lord, save now. So we're going to sing, cry out for salvation. Let's sing it. Come on. To the King of glory and light, oh praises, to the only giver of life, our maker, the gates are open wide, we worship Got it. Come see what love has done. Come see what love has done. Amazing. He bought us with His blood. Our Savior. The cross has overcome. We worship You. Come on, shout Hosanna. Shout Hosanna. Jesus, He saves. Shout Hosanna. The same power that rolled the stone away, the same power alive in us today. King Jesus, we call upon your name, no other name. Come on, sing that, the same power. The same power that rolled the stone away. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. That's what the gospel is all about. So I want us to stand and sing as worship as people who were dead and have been made alive in Christ. Come now, fount of every blessing. Let's sing. Come now, fount of every blessing. To my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never cease. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise His name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. 
I was lost in darkness. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was found by all my sin. Your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a never be alone because Jesus is always with us. He's promised to never leave or forsake us. His grace is sufficient for you today. Let's sing this next verse about His grace. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a better by my wandering heart to I'm prone to wonder, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy voice of love. Here's my heart, here's my heart, Lord. Let's sing this verse again. I was lost in utter darkness. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was found by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul has a new song. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me. And I'll never be alone. Praise the Lord. Amen. But we thank you that we're never alone. Thank you that you are always with us. Draw us close to yourself today as we worship. Sing this, church. I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real, death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one.
and shame before you. The demons run and flee at the mention of your name, King of Majesty. There is no power in hell for any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, 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 the great I am. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside me, God Almighty, the great
Well, if you would take your Bibles and go to the book of John, chapter 1. As you're turning there a moment ago, uh, my friend Mark King prayed, and you may have noticed he, he's not from around here. That, uh, that's not a southern accent he's got. Um, me and Mark, we meet every Monday, and we pray and uh, have breakfast together and uh, do a Bible study. And, but uh, he, he's a, a very um, resourceful person. He was a HVAC owner of a big company in New York City, worked on little small buildings like the Empire State Building, things like that. And God brought him down here, brought him to our church, and uh, has become a dear friend. He came and rescued me the other day at my house. I was trying to put some electrical um, circuits in my house, and um, if it had not been for Mark, uh, I may not be here. So uh, he, he, uh, he knew what he was doing, and I did not. So uh, I'm very thankful for, for my friend and um, for his willingness to serve in our church. John chapter 1, and just one verse. So this will be a short sermon. It, it, it may have to be short because that first bunch, there was a lot of sinners in that first group, so I had to preach really hard. Um, so my voice may not last long, so I, we may just have to close up shop because this is, you know, there's not a lot of sinners here. So um, 15 little words in this verse, verse 17. But these 15 words are world-changing because there are three concepts here we see that the Lord Jesus unites and brings together. <clears throat> and as he brings them together, they are the concepts that come together to bring salvation to all humanity. And it's astounding what impact we see this verse having. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses. Let me just stop right there. Moses was not the lawgiver. It was not the law of Moses. God is the lawgiver. The law came through Moses. He was just the conduit. He was the human vehicle that he brought the law off the mountain. But God's the one who wrote the law. God's the one who gave it to us. So the law was given through Moses, but grace, and we've heard a lot about grace. I was just amazed. John and I did not, he did not know what I was preaching on today, and the Lord has just kind of orchestrated all this together, all these songs and the verses, you know, Grace. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Astounding. Those three concepts, law, grace, and truth. And we're going to begin with the law. We're going to take all three of these concepts, kind of break it apart, look at them, examine them, and then bring it all together at the end and see how they come together to work to help us understand and realize the need that we have, salvation, and how these concepts these eternal, timeless truths bring life to us. So the law. And with the law, I want to begin by saying I call this a monument of love, a monument of love. God wrote this monument. He, en he engraved these ten little words on, this, on these little tablets and gave it to humanity. And it's the most endearing, the most impactful monument the world's ever, ever seen. Now, the stones are long gone, but the words continue, and they still reverberate all throughout history. They still impact societies all around the world. The law of God, the monument of love. And, you know, as humans, we love monuments. If you go to downtown Pensacola, you just walk around, you begin to see monuments to all kinds of events and people and things that happened in history, and, and we love monuments. You go to Washington, D.C., it's just a wash in monuments everywhere. There are monuments, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, just obelisk and statues and all kinds of things. We just had the Martin Luther King Jr. monument just erected. We've got the World War II monument all over the place. The monument to Iwo Jima, it's just, it's amazing. The mon we love monuments. You know, there's, you know, the Statue of Liberty. There's Mount Rushmore. There's, um, you know, Stone Mountain in Georgia. There's the monument to Crazy Horse out in, in Wyoming. I remember being in, in Istanbul and seeing the monument that Constantine erected. It's this, he, he, he had this big stone table erected, and all the carvings on it are almost all eroded away. And he had on top of this pedestal put an obelisk that at the time was 2,000 years old, put there, and today it still stands. And that obelisk that the Egyptians carved looks just like you had laser cut it yesterday. It's amazing, an incredible monument. We, we are people, we love 
monuments. We love things that endure and, and, and commemorate things that have happened. And God gave us the monument of love, the Ten Commandments, the law of God. But this monument was not some vicious, angry, malicious, malevolent God screaming at us, don't do this. This was a monument of love. This was a, a monument that gave us a warning, and as a warning that comes out of a, the heart of God that says, I love you enough to tell you what is right and what is wrong, to give you objective truth, to show you what the standard is. And unfortunately, when you stand up next to that standard, you begin to realize just how straight, how high, how far it is, and just how crooked and how small and how we do not measure up. It's a, it's a monument, it's, it's a warning, but it's a warning of, of love. It shows us God's love for us. It shows us also our need for Him. Because we begin to look at God's law and we begin to see just how wretched we are, how sinful we are. It says we've got a need. And we've got a choice to make. Either we begin to believe that there is sin in the world, and there's right and wrong, there's objective truth, or we just throw all that away, and we just say, look, there's no objective truth. There's no right, wrong, there's no good, bad. You know, we just live as human beings. We're just a collection of molecules and chemicals and electrical impulses, and we just have a short existence, and we just do what we want to do, and then once we're gone, it, it's like we never existed. The universe never takes notice. And if you murder a million people or, or one person, it's no big deal. It's no different than one lion killing another lion over an antelope. It's just survival of the fittest. It's just, you know, and so we have a choice to make. Either there's objective truth, and there's law, and that law says, I'm here, I'm God, I'm real, and you are people that I created, and also you're sinful, and you have a need. Or God does not exist. There is no truth. We can live how we want to live. And let's just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And that's the choice that we have. But there is truth, and there is a law of God, and this law comes out of a heart of love. He is trying to show us who we are and who He is and just what our need is. This is God throwing humanity a lifeline. We are drowning, and He is saying, I am trying to rescue you, and you need to first understand you're drowning. If you don't think you have a need, you're never going to reach out and grab that life ring. You're going to say, I don't need it. I'm not drowning. I'm fine. And in your stubbornness, you're going to perish. And so the law is a teacher, a teacher. It teaches us who we are, who God is. I don't know if you've ever had a, a very tough, hard teacher, but they were so inspirational, they made you want to continue to take their classes. I had one of those people in seminary. His name was Rick Byerjohn. And through Dr. Byerjohn, I developed this great love for the Old Testament and, and the, the love for Deuteronomy. But he was brutal. And, I mean, he was hard. But he just made you want to learn. I had a coach like that in, in high school. His name's Frank Lay. I mean, the things he, he did to us on the track, you know, you get locked up for these days. You know, I mean, it's just, it was inhuman. <laughs> but whenever he told the track team at the end of our 10th grade year he was not coming back, he was going to go be the vice principal, it was heartbreaking. I was like, no, this, this can't be. Why? Because, you know, he was a teacher. And that teacher helped me and showed me things and taught me things. But also, the law is a judge as well. It's an objective standard of right and wrong. I don't know if you've ever been before a judge, but you know, a judge just says, this is what happened, and this is, you know, you're guilty or not guilty. I've been before a judge twice. <clears throat> Fortunately, they were minor infractions, but still it's pretty intimidating because, you know, this person has a lot of power. They can render a judgment on you that affects your life. And the law is a judge. It judges us as righteous or unrighteous. And so the law is a good thing. Jesus said, do not think in Matthew 17 that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Paul talks in Galatians 3.23 about the law being a, a guard and a teacher to bring us to Christ. The law is a good thing. It is, it is God's statement of love to us, of how much He loves and cares for us, is a monument 
of love. It is not in com competition with grace. There's not some yin-yang kind of deal with grace being light and the law being dark and they're opposed to each other. No, they, they, they are partners together to walk together to bring us to salvation. The law is a good thing. The law is a statement of love. So I want us just to briefly go through the Ten Commandments. It's good to read them every now and then. The Ten Commandments God gave us were revolutionary. And they're still relevant today. It's not passe. They've not, they're not just some bunch of hackneyed old sayings that you know, someone recorded. These are just as relevant today as the day they walked with Moses down that mountain and the, tone, the stone tabs were still smoking from the finger of God carving those statements in them. Still applicable today. Listen to this. You shall have no other gods before me. And of course that term before me means in front of my face. Now, we know that God sees everything and is everywhere, and so you can't have secret gods. He's saying, don't have other gods. Because they're not real. You're just, you're just doing things that hurt you, and it's an insult to me, and so do not have any other gods because I am the only one. The exclusivity of, of God, that he is the only one, starts right here with the law. He says, this is it. There's not some great pantheon of gods and we're all in this together in some mountain that we're all, that the humanity's climbing from different paths. There's only one way, only one God. He says, don't have any other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image. And what God is saying there is, is understand, if you try to boil me down to the essence of some little statue or, or some painting, you're just insulting me and degrading yourself because you cannot capture my essence in some little idol. Don't even try, because I cannot be localized. I am everywhere, and I am the one God who cannot be contained. So he says, don't make an image. And he says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And of course, we live in a world that is just awash in vile, awful, filthy language, but that's not really what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is that you use God's name in a worthless way. Either you are some pious, hypocritical person who stands up in church and, oh, you know, and you give a great testimony, and you go out and live like an absolute wretch, and you defame the name of God because people know he goes to that church. Or you walk up to someone and say, well, God told me to do this, and God did not tell you. And you just use God's name as either a way to get what you want or to manipulate people. You bring shame upon the name of God. And God's saying, do not use my name in a worthless way, either through your words or through your living. Honor my name because it is powerful. And it represents my character. And then he says, observe the Sabbath day. This is God saying, look, I love you enough to give you a day of rest. And on that day of rest, I want you to come together and to worship me. I want you to honor me with one day out of your work week to where you set aside everything and you say, I'm going to trust God enough to not try to make an income on this one day. And I'm going to rest and I'm going to worship God. And so this is about holiness and being set apart and dedicated to God. When the world says, don't do that, live for yourself, just do what you want to do on these days because they're yours. And God's saying, it's not yours. Your days are numbered by me. And the Sabbath day is a day I've given to you. And then he says, honor your father and your mother. And this is the bridge commandment. This is the command that right here in this group, high schoolers and middle schoolers, you're learning this one. Because if you get this one right now, you'll get it right with the police, with politicians, with your boss. You know, there's a reason why millennials are being fired greater than any other group in the history of America. And that's because they have no respect for authority. And they think, well, I don't have to listen to my boss. I do what I want to do, and I'll show up when I want to show up, and I don't have to work hard, and I don't want to, you know, do all that he's told me to do or she told me to do. And so I'm just, you know, and they have no respect, and they're getting fired at a tremendous rate. And the problem is they didn't learn to respect their parents. That doesn't mean that your parents are right every time. They're not. It doesn't mean that every parent is even honorable, but 
you must find a way to learn to respect them and honor them even when they're wrong or they're dishonorable people. So, honor your father and mother. And then he says, do not murder. And this command is about respecting and loving life. Loving life above things, above possessions, above property, that you do not put anything above life. That you don't see people as standing in your way and you've got to get rid of them. You don't see a person as, as a hindrance to you, and so we've got to find a way to, to get rid of them. And we are in a world filled with violence. You watch our movies and television, it's all about murder and killing, and people are just being wasted because they're in the way. And that's the way of the world and should not be the way of God's people, to murder other people because they just end the way. You should not commit adultery. And this is about keeping your covenant. This is about keeping the, the covenant in your home as well as your covenant to God. And you shall not steal. And this, 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 this command is about, is about faith. I'm going to trust God to meet my needs. I don't have to go steal from my employer or take from my neighbor or, or you know, go rob a liquor store. Or cheat on my taxes. Because God provides for me. And I don't have to steal to get what I want or what I need. Because I should be satisfied with who God is to me. And grateful for what he's given to me. And so I don't need to steal. You know, God has a curious relationship with thieves. You know, the first people we encounter in scripture, Adam and Eve, were thieves. They stole something was not, that was not theirs. And all through scripture, God is dealing with thieves. On the cross, Jesus is hung between two thieves. All throughout Scripture, we see this curious relationship with thieves and how God deals with thieves. And even when dealing with thieves, he shows them mercy. He doesn't cut off their hands. He doesn't keep, he says, if you steal, you ought to, you ought to give back. And he allows them to keep working and to, to come back into society. God is the God who loves thieves. But he still tells them, do not steal. You should not bear false witness. You know, we need truth. And this is about a legal society that if it has truth, it functions properly. If it doesn't and there's no truth, you have chaos and anarchy. And God is saying you should be truthful people. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then the last one is you shall not covet. And this one deals with the heart. It's the only one who de that deals with, with the inside. And it's about what you desire. And you can be this upstanding looking Christian and you just, you know, you come to church and all this stuff. And on the inside, you're just roiling with jealousy and envy. And I ought to have that. And I wish I had this. And I deserve this. And that guy does it. And I wish I had a, had a husband like him or a wife like her. And you just, you're coveting all that. I deserve this. And God is saying, don't covet those things. Trust me. And so it's about our motives. And that's the law of God. And the law of God is good. It's not a bunch of prohibitions and do's and don'ts and stop doing this and you can't have fun. It's about God saying, I love you enough to tell you the truth and tell you what is right and what is wrong because I want to have a relationship with you. Dr. Martin Lord-Jones, who was at Westminster Chapel where the pastor will be visiting there, he and Miss Liz, they left yesterday, flew out um, as Bennett was driving out to go to law school at seven o'clock in the morning, they were loading up his truck and trying to get in my car to go to the airport. It was a very emotional day for the trailers. Um, and so they're, they're right now in France, gonna go, go to Normandy and then go back to England and see all these sites. And one place they're gonna see is Westminster Chapel. And there Martin Lloyd-Jones preached in 1959. He says, holiness means righteousness. And being righteous means keeping the law. Therefore, if you're so-called grace, which we're about to talk about grace, what you say you have received does not make you keep the law. You have not received grace. What is grace? Well, it's that marvelous gift which God has given. Having delivered a person from the curse of the law, enables that person to keep the law and be righteous as Christ was righteous, for he kept the law perfectly. Grace. And so we move from this monument of love to what I call the mystery of love, which is grace. It's the greatest gift that Christianity has given the world because we live in a world that does not understand grace. It is so foreign to us. Grace. We understand judgment. We understand law. We, we interact with the law every day. And we, we, you know, we want retribution when people have done stuff wrong to us. But grace is strange. Because grace is God giving us something that while we were enemies and 
hating him and not wanting to have him in our lives and saying, go away and leave us alone, he still comes and dies for us to give us life when we didn't want life, we didn't deserve life, and he still lavishes us with life. That is grace. And so we have an understanding of law and judgment and all that stuff, but grace is different. Yesterday was a, an eventful day at the Lewis household. Now, my daughter's in this room. She knows this is coming. This is part of, of just, you know, what happened yesterday. I told her, you get to be a sermon example now. <clears throat> because I was at my parents' house with my family, um, and we had a family work day at my parents' house trying to help them clean up and stuff like that. And then Kristen comes up and says, you know, I need to tell you something. Britton, who's she's my 16-year-old driving the car, she... Um, She's backing out of the driveway, and we just moved into a, a new house, not a brand new house, it's, it's new to us, but it's one of those houses they built the, you know, the big stone um, mailboxes. So we had one of those. It was beautiful. <laughs> and somehow the gravitational forces of the earth shifted, and as she was backing out, the, the gravity pulled that car out into the yard, into the mailbox, and, of course, that mailbox was propelled out into the road. Well, you know, my brother was there, and he's got a big tractor, and so we said, all right, let's go over there. And so I'm in the truck with my brother. Of course, he's had four daughters and a son, and he's been through this whole deal. Totaled a lot of cars, and he's telling me everything I did not want to hear. It's a teachable moment, you know, just, you know, all this stuff that's like, just, you know, stop. You know, I don't want to hear this. And so I've got a decision to make when I get there. You know, I know my daughter's upset. She didn't, you know, want to destroy the mailbox and, into a million pieces and, you know, and <laughs> keep us from getting the mail and all that. <laughs> that was not her intention. Um, and so we pull into the, you know, the road and we can see her and David's like, well, she's, she's upset. And I was like, yes. She's upset, I'm upset, you know, we're all upset, you know. <laughs> so I had a decision to make. Do I want law in this moment? Judgment? Retribution? You know, am I going to be like Christ? And so, um, so I get out of the truck, you know, and she's coming up, and she's upset. And I said, well, hey, has the mail run yet today, you know? <laughs> so we laughed, and it kind of broke this you know, the whole spell of, you know, dad's, you know, coming down with judgment. Um, so we, you know, we've got to work that whole thing out, you know, how we're going to fix the mailbox and, and all that. But, you know, that's a small thing. And it's easy to overreact about small things, especially dads are notorious for doing that. Because we want, you know, we want to have, you know, law and judgment and yet we didn't receive that from Christ. He gave us grace. He showed us something we didn't deserve. And so this mysterious concept is something that we, we struggle with and we wrestle with. And how, how, do we, how do we show grace when we've been given so much and yet it, it's something that is so foreign to us? And there's a song that we sing. It's called Amazing Grace. And, and you may know the story about John Newton. You know, he, he, was, he grew up as a young man. He, his, his father was a slave ship trader. His mother died when he was, he was 10, living in England, and he was, he was angry. And so he went um, and was captured in what was called then Shanghai. He was put on a, on a ship, and they made him a midshipman because he was kind of an educated person. He was in line to be an officer, but he, he mutinied against the captain. He wanted to kill the captain, and, you know, they, he, was, he was flogged. You know, they stretched him out you know, on an iron bed, and they, 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 they flogged him with like 70 or 80 lashes, and they reduced him down in rank to just, you know, to just a, a, a rank seaman. And he, he fled the ship, was captured and taken to Africa. And there he was sold into slavery to a woman who would put him in a cage and she would abuse him, and she would bring him out, put a chain around his neck, and make him bark like a dog, and he was angry, and he was addicted to, to, to drugs, and he loved alcohol, and this was a wretched man. And finally, his father hired someone to go find him, and the guy came and rescued him, and he began to bring him back, and he, and he went 
right into the same life as followers in, which was a life of, of slavery, of, of human trafficking. And he began to sail on these ships and he began to capture people and, 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 and take them from their homeland to places like America and to England and to Europe. And he loved that life and he loved doing this to people. And one day there was a storm that came up and he began to cry out to God because the ship was taking on water and the cargo in the ship shifted to fill the hole that was in the ship. As if to say to him, God was saying, I'm here. I know who you are and I love you. This sin-benighted, wretched man, he didn't give his life to Christ because he kept in the slave trade lifestyle. And then another storm came up, and in that storm, he said to Christ, I give you my life. And he went back to England, and a friend began to mentor him, and he became a clergyman, he became an abolitionist, he began to fight against the slave trade. And him and William Cowper, would get together and they would write songs. And of course, one of the songs that he wrote was Amazing Grace. And this horrible, wretched human being, God reached into his dark life and pulled him up out of that. When he did not deserve it, he deserved death and hell. And the Lord saved him. Grace. See, grace is something that all of us need. Because it's a great equalizer. Grace is the universal need of all humanity. Because, you know, some of us can be better than others. And some of us have a hard time being good. But all of us are bad. See, in my family, I I was the good kid, you know, out of the four. But in reality, what that means is I was the sneaky one. (laughs) I was able to get away with the stuff that my brother and two sisters were not able to get away with. And so even for the sneaky middle children... They need grace because they're just as wretched as the ones who aren't smart enough not to get caught. (laughs) Grace is what all of us need. And Christ came and brought it into our world when it was not here. It was a foreign concept. And he came and said, I'm going to die for you and I'm going to pay the price for your sin. And I'm going to redeem you out of your slavery and out of your your darkened world and all of the debauchery and the enslavement. And I'm going to pull you up. If you'll just accept this grace through faith and believe that I died for you and I rose again, you can be saved. You can be released from this horrible, awful place called sin. And so we see the monument of love that God declares his love through his law. We see the mystery of love where grace comes into this world that had no grace. And then we see the message of love, and that is truth. Truth. The message of love. Because we need truth. We crave truth. We wake up in the morning and we want to know what is true and what is false. Can I believe this commentator on the television? Can I believe this news organization? Can I believe what I read on the, you know, the, the can? Can I, can I believe the things I see? Can I believe the things I hear? We want truth and we crave it and so often we, we miss truth because there's so much falsehood around us. But God has a message of love and it is the truth of who he is and who we are. I, I love the story that Ravi Zacharias, and Ravi Zacharias, he's a, he's a Christian apologist. He's a, just an incredibly educated man from, from India. He, he went through Oxford, and he just travels the world sharing the gospel. But he, he, he tells a story about whenever he was just a young man, he was in Vietnam preaching the gospel to the, the U.S. troops and the South Vietnamese troops, and he had an interpreter whose name was Hen Fan. And he and Hen would travel, and the day came when Robbie had to leave and go back to England, and Hen stayed behind. And of course, that was in 1968, and, and, and things just got worse and worse. And eventually the U.S. pulled out, and then the, the, the Viet Cong came in, took over the country, and a lot of people were able to flee and leave. And you've seen the pictures of helicopters landing on ships and them pushing the helicopters off into the ocean so more helicopters could land. And Hen wanted to be on one of those helicopters, but could not make it. And so he was captured, put into prison. And it was an awful, terrible, wretched place. And here's this Christian man 
who has declared his Christianity, living now in an atheistic, communistic society, and his captures are taunting him every day. There is no God. You are a fool for believing this Jesus Christ. And they would make him read books by Hegel and by Engels and Marx, all the great atheists who gave us so much hope and so much death in the last century. And this went on for years, and they would torture him, and they would, they would torment him day and night and trying to get him to renounce his faith. And the day came, he woke up one morning, and he said, I can't take it anymore. I am not going to believe in God anymore. He's left me here. He's abandoned me. I can't take it anymore, and th- th- today is it. And that morning, as the prisoners were gathered, they were, of course, singled out to go do the different task of the camp. The commandant called him forward and said, Hen, today you get to have latrine duty. You get to go clean the latrines. Now, if you've been to any third world country, and I'm sorry to be a little graphic here, but to understand the story, we've got to kind of understand what happens in third world countries, and especially in horrible, terrible prison camps. There's no plumbing. And so toilet paper does not go down the drain. It's usually put in a basket. And it's wretched and foul and awful. And so his job was to go and clean all those baskets out and to take all the befouled paper out of there. It's awful. And as he's doing this, he's angry, he's mad, he's lost his faith, and as he's emptying a basket, he sees a piece of paper. And it's got English on it. And it it is befouled with human filth. But something compels him to pick it up. And he he goes over to the sink and he washes it off. And the words that jump off the page were these words of Romans 8, 28. For all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You see, what had happened was the commandant had been given a Gideon Bible by a Christian missionary. And, of course, he could care less about the Bible, but he used it for toilet paper. And Hen began to cry, and he said, the one day that I lose my faith and I abandon God is the very day that, God, you send me a message of how much you love me and you still care for me and you're still looking out for me. And so he went to the commandant and he said, I want to clean the latrines every day. The guy's like, okay, you're crazy, fine, do that. And every day he would go through the trash cans And every day there would be another piece of paper or two pieces of paper in there, and they would be from the Bible. And he began to collect the New Testament through this awful, terrible process. And God continued to speak to him and say to him, even here, I know where you are. Even in the most awful, terrible, evil place you could be in, I'm there with you. You're my child and I love you. And the day came when Hen was released from prison and him and some other captives were released and, and they just decided that they were going to leave Vietnam. Of course, that was illegal. They had a little boat and they were going to go across the sea to Thailand and they were preparing the boat and five Viet Cong prison guards came to him and said, we know what you're doing. We know you're trying to escape, aren't you? Well, he didn't know what to do and he said, no, I'm not trying to escape. That's... that's, that's preposterous. Why would I do that? That's no. The men walked away. And God spoke to him in that moment and said, you know, here you are trying to run your life again. Why can't you just be honest with what is going on? And he felt so ashamed of himself. And so the next day when those guys came back and they said, we, we know you're trying to escape. And looked at those men and said, Yes, we are. And if if you need to lock me up, that's fine. I'm going to be honest. And they said, we don't want to lock you up. We want to go with you. (laughs) And so those men got in the boat. And here's the astounding thing about it. Those five men were fishermen. If it had not been for them, when they got out into the sea, they, they would have perished because they did not know how to sail. And there was a storm that came up and almost sank the ship. But because of those five men being in the ship, they got them to Thailand. And when he got to Thailand... He was rescued, he was cleaned up, and he flew to Los Angeles. He called his friend Ravi Zacharias and told him what God had done, how he had rescued him. Truth. The truth is, even in the most awful, terrible place, God is there. Even in our our darkest moments, 
We're the most wretched, awful. God still loves us, and his grace is still available to us. There's never a point where, we're, where he says, go away, I don't love you, I don't want to have a relationship with you. That is not who God is. God loves us. And that is the message of truth. We've got to have truth. We do. If we don't have truth, we're, we're, we're in a world of chaos and a world of mess. We're in, a, we're in a terrible, dark place. But Jesus breaks into our lives with this light of truth and says, here's who I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you can have life eternal if you will follow me, if you will be my disciple. Many of you, you're here, and you, you, you remember that journey. You remember the darkness. You remember the point when the light broke in and truth was triggered, and you began to understand, wait a second. I am sinful, and I am lost. And Jesus is offering me something that is beyond compare. And you stepped out of darkness into light through faith, into his grace, because you begin to say, I believe who you are. I believe that you, you died and rose again. I believe you want to take me to heaven and give me a place to live with you. I believe in you, and I'm going to give my life to you. You remember that journey. But you may be a Christian. You may be like Hen Fan, who perhaps you're in a dark place now as a Christian. It may be of your own making. It may be just circumstances of life. You may have lost your job. Your family may be breaking up. It could be health issues. And right now you're discouraged. And you need to understand that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And God has not forgotten you. He loves you and cares for you. And deliverance is coming. And that deliverance may not be the way you think it's going to be, but it's coming. He loves you, Christian. He cares for you. But you may be here today, and you have never said yes to Christ. And you know it. You've run from it. But yet every time you run from it, it's like turning turn to run from a lion. You run right into a bear because you can't run from God. And every time you turn to run, there's somebody else sitting there saying, hey, I want to invite you to come to church. Hey, have you ever considered reading the Bible? And it just drives you insane because you don't want to hear this stuff. And the truth is everywhere. And you turn on the television, and there's some preacher, this, and, and, and just some verse that, that he speaks. And, it's, and that is God trying to get your attention. And what he's saying to you is that I love you, and you need me. And I have the answer for your problem, which is sin and death. And if you'll accept the grace that comes through my son Jesus, you can have life. But it just simply means you've got to have faith and you've got to turn over your life and you've got to say, I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to live for Christ and I'm going to believe in him and whatever he says do, I'm going to do. Wherever he says go, I'm going to go. I'm going to give him the title to my life. It is his. I'm now bought with a price. I'm not my own. Whatever the Lord says, I say yes. And that's what it means because that is the step of faith you need to take of stepping into grace. And as you give your life up and give it to him, he gives it right back to you, but he gives you life abundantly. And so today as we kind of wrap all this up, there's the monument of love, the law that we're sinful, we don't measure up. There's the mystery of love, the grace that came into our world, which is just unbelievable that God would do something like that for us. There's the message of love, and that is truth. Truth is that we're sinful, we need God, we need Christ, we need His grace, and that He's real. And He has a place for us. He has a plan for us in this life, and He's got a place and a plan for us in the life to come. And that's the real message of truth today. I'm Pastor Ted Trailer of Olive Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Joey Rogers of Pace Assembly, and we want you to mark your calendars now for September the 11th at 6 p.m. for United in Prayer. We're excited about bringing our churches together, and we want to invite you to join us at the Pensacola Bay Center on 9-11. We need spiritual awakening in our community. And this is the time to gather the church, September the 11th, 6 p.m. at the Pensacola Bay Center.